Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series as Pastor Jeremy Edmondson continues through creation. So we're in the middle of a series, and it's a long series. We're calling it Foundational Framework. And the reason is, is because if there's anything that is important in life, it is how you think about life, how you perceive what truth and reality are. Knowing that there is an amazing truth claim of an almighty God who declares that he alone is the creator and there is none like him whatsoever and everything else is a creation, therefore it is all subject and subservient to him is offensive to the carnal mind, is offensive to the unregenerate heart. And let's be honest, for some Christians it gets a little offensive because we end up feeling like pincushions because the Word of God's poking us to death. But the reason is, is because truth makes a statement. And truth is not something to be compromised or toyed with. And so I think that's very important for us to have an understanding together as a church, unified in how we are thinking about God. The most important thought you will ever think is what you think about God, and it defines greatly who you are, greatly. Defines how you live, defines how you spend your money, defines the choices that you make, defines what you value, and it defines what you choose to pass on to everyone around you, including your kids. So it is central and it is integral to everything that we're dealing with. So, if you would, take your Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 2. This is where we are. We just finished with what Vern read earlier about the idea that when God surveyed and assessed everything that he had made over six days, it was very good. Now remember, two important points that we've been noticing so far. When we see things like, and God said or this is the word of the Lord type of things. We don't take it lightly. Why? Because when God speaks, everything that he speaks is true. Everything that he speaks is right. And regardless of how we think about it, everything that he speaks is good. Even when it's in judgment, even when it's assessing a wrong situation, it is good because it is completely consistent with who he is. He never speaks out of character. Never. The second interesting thing that we have been seeing is that when God says it is good or it is very good, he is making a moral declaration about what is right and what is wrong. And especially with what we saw last week under the heading of man is what? Man and woman or male and female. Exactly. Under that heading. And notice in a perfect environment, you have this equality. Are roles different? Yes. But is one inferior to the other? It's not how God made it. So that's the first divine institution that we see is the structure of the family and how that should work. Today, we are going to deal with the second divine institution. And I'm a little weirded out about how to communicate this to everybody because there is so much to touch on. When you hit chapter three, it just all rolls down the river like it's no, you know, it just goes. But there is so much to set up foundationally in order to move forward. So here are the foundational truths that we need to understand, and they've been the same. They're going to change next week a little bit. But number one, the Bible is God's self-revelation. It is what he wants you to know about him. Can you know about the fact that there is something greater from you than looking at, in looking at creation? Yes, you can. But as far as specially revealing the intimate details of who God is, and notice, if he didn't take the time to reveal himself, he wouldn't want to make himself known. But he has and he does. Everybody with me? Okay. Uh, the second one, God is eternal, And sovereign creator. He is the ruler. How many people read the paper that I put out there, the 20-page paper on what does it mean for God to be sovereign? Everybody took it and nobody read it. I printed up 45 copies of that thing. Okay, four of you have read it. The rest of you, questioning your salvation right now, let's be honest. Not really. No, not at all. But I think it's important for us to understand because what you'll find in this paper is a lot of what is touted today as God being sovereign is not what the Bible says about God being sovereign. 
We are thinking according to popular opinions in theology. We're not thinking according to biblical mandates that have been clearly lined out for us. Our thinking needs to be in line with this, and here's what you'll find. If your thinking is aligned with this, you'll actually find a lot of friction with Christians. Everybody's bought into the system. Everybody's bought into the Lifeway store. Everybody's bought into the, 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 the worship paradigm. Everybody is bought into all these little subsects of Christianity that we have, and this is what makes the Bible so striking. Okay? Soapbox for just a second. Few people read it, instead of allowing for somebody else who is a popular pastor or theologian or a book or whatever to give them how they should think about life. That is dangerous. Even with me, do not ever take anything I say as true. Examine everything according to the Word of God. And then send me an email, leave me a voicemail, whatever it is, knock on my door and come tell me why I'm wrong. Please. It only matters what the Word of God says. So let's move forward. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his, what's the word? Work Work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day. Now, this is the third time we've seen him blessing something. He blessed the animals, told them to be fruitful and multiply. He blessed Adam and Eve, told them to be fruitful and multiply. And now he blesses this day that is set apart. It says, and made it holy. It is removed from common use. It's not like every other day. Something different is happening here. And notice it says, because on it, God rested, notice that they're giving you the reason, from all his that he had done in creation. Let me ask you a question. How is God described in these first three verses? He's a worker. He is a laborer. He is somebody who has taken time, who has crafted with skill, who has brought about the necessary elements in order to have what we see. Remember, how does God create? Speaking, nobody else does that. Nobody else says it, and what was not now is. No one else. No one else in all of pagan mythology, and this is odd, shows you they haven't read the Bible, is smart enough to pick up on that to develop their pagan sense of origins. It's always something started with something started with something, and little kids get this when we give them a box of Legos and tell them to go to town. They're starting with something, and they're creating something out of it. God starts with nothing. The only thing that exists is Him, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God said, that's when it takes place. So we serve an awesome, amazing God. Now He is trying to show us something. It is good to work, and it is good to rest. Anybody in here a workaholic? Anybody in here a (laughs) restaholic? Way more hands went up. Oh, preach it, brother, preach it. You started washing windows on that one, didn't you? Oh, brother. Restaholic. Amazing. Notice here that God is saying, here is my work. I'm done. I'm resting. Now, here's what's interesting about this seventh day. We don't get an inkling that on Sunday, that'll make you think for a second, the work week starts again and he's going to start creating again. We don't get that inkling. Everybody know that the Sabbath is really Saturday and the reason why we celebrate is because of the resurrection of Christ on Sunday. Okay, just making sure. I don't want anybody to be like, what? He's crazy. Just making sure. Okay. So in doing that, notice that he describes himself. He desires to be known as a laborer. But he's going to do something very interesting. And I want to show you again, I'm sorry to pepper this and it seems like that we're peppering around, but there's so many things that this tells us that we got to hit in order to get to chapter three. So look at verse four. These are the generations. That word in Hebrew is the word toledoth is what it is. And when it talks about generations, it is talking about the idea of what is perpetuating forward existence is the idea. Genesis is set up in what is known as a Toledoth structure. It will stop somewhere in telling you about reality, and it will say, and now here are the descendants of Adam, and these are the descendants of Abraham. You know, all those places where we skip in the Bible when we read, right? 
genealogy, get me to the next chapter kind of thing. Why are they there? They're important. Why? Because a written record is traceable. How does Matthew chapter 1 start? The genealogy of who? It's deeply spiritual, isn't it? Is it? Actually, it is. If you study it out, you can trace Jesus' genealogy because it is validity that he is who he said he was. Not just descended from Abraham, descended from David. It sets him up as not just a Jew inheriting promise, but also as the rightful king of Israel who should be ruling and reigning. Very important for us to see. Genealogies are not a waste of time. So anytime you see one, challenge yourself and take the time to work through it and do some research on who you're dealing with. It's very valuable to study that. So it's a total scripture. Here are the generations. Now, the interesting thing about this first one mentioned is it doesn't say, here are the generations of the man in the garden. It doesn't say that. It's talking more about the creation of the days. And so look how it moves on here. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heaven or the earth and the heavens. Now, two interesting things here. Don't everybody lose your mind, okay? But notice what it says in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Did the Lord God make the heavens and the earth in one day? No, he made it in six, didn't he? So notice here, context determines meaning. How should I take this word day? How did we take it before? And there was evening and there was morning. The first what? Was there any question about what the clarity of context is of what a day consists of there? Not at all. But notice here, notice that it says, in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. What is that talking about? It's talking about that it encompasses a group of time. Now, that's not blasphemous and that's not heretical. That's simply reading the Bible for the plain literal meaning of what it says. Use the context to determine the meaning. Now, it does something else interesting here, and I'm sure you've gone over this before, but what do we see that's unique? Do we know? What's unique in this that we have not seen yet? What is it? Man? Man? No? No? Everybody notice the Lord God. The Lord God. How, he, how has he been described before? Elohim. Elohim. God. God. And God said. And God said. Chapter 2, verse 4 is the first use of the phrase, the Lord God. And when we look at Lord, we are talking about Yahweh is his personal name, his covenant name with Israel. And his name can mean either, and scholars debate on this, I am, or it can mean I cause to be, is what it is. He is the uncaused cause. He is always. He is not bound by time. But when you deal with this Lord, and I have it, have it here, I'm using the English Standard Version, capital L-O-R-D, is that what you have? It's all capitals. L looks a little bit more capital. I don't know. Somebody got real nitpicky about that one, right? That was the OCD guy, right? But notice, L-O-R-D, Yahweh is what that is. Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. Now, some of your translations, if you have something different, might use the word Jehovah. Does anybody have Jehovah? Is that the New American Standard? Is that what you have? Okay, so is that not there? Is that not is that not there in your translation? Oh, that's the study notes. That's all right. That's all right. I'm kind of glad it's not. No, no, it's good. It's good. I'm kind of glad it's not because Jehovah actually ends up being where Jews didn't want to say Yahweh's name. There's a command in Leviticus that if you blaspheme his name, you deserve death. They were like, well, we're not talking about him at all. Now, with the Hebrew language, it doesn't have any vowels in the original. They weren't added until about 500 uh, A.D., I believe that it was, where they had vowels to learn pronunciation. But what they did was, is they took the word Adonai, and they used the vowels from the word Adonai, which means Lord, my Lord type of thing, and they posed them in on Yahweh, and they came up with the word Jehovah is how they came up with it. So that's how it came about to be. It's a hybrid mixture because they didn't want to say the word Yahweh. In fact, if you can ever do any research about whenever they would go about and they're, they're transcribing 
copying over. And when they came to the word Yahweh, man, they undertook some stuff. They went, took a bath, scrubbed down, got out Brillo pads, put on new clothes and everything, got a special pen, wrote it, broke the pen, threw it away, went and took a bath, got redone, and then did it again. Can you imagine? And God said, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord. That's a lot of bathing. Some dry skin, man. That's probably where lotion came from was during the translation process. Like, I'm chafed up. I don't know. But anyway, maybe the Lord God, this whole idea, this is his proper name. This is his intimate name. This is the name he wants to be known by and invites to be known by. So notice, as the Bible goes on, we are progressively learning more about him. Now notice it says, verse 5, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused caused it to rain on the land. It didn't rain in the beginning at all, didn't need to. And there was no man to work the ground. Interesting how that's set up there. Verse 6. How did it get its nourishment? And the mist, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then, we looked at this last week, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. Then, the Lord God formed, created, fashioned is the idea. Very careful, meticulous involvement. The man of the dust, that's our physical makeup, from the ground and breathe, notice, intimate, Special. He didn't do this. He didn't breathe into the nostrils of the rhinoceroses. That did not happen. But he did take us. He did take Adam and breathe into him. And notice what it says. The breath of life. And the man became a living soul, a living creature. Verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And notice this, is Eden perfect? Eden is perfect. Eden has everything that Adam needs for success of whatever God calls him to do. Now here's what stumps us, and I need to spend way more time studying it admittedly. It tells us that Eden was in the east, right? This is all pre-flood, okay? So the landscape, geography, everything is extremely different than what we're seeing because the flood covered the entire earth. But look what happens, what, they, what, what Moses does here. It's very interesting. It says here, um, sorry, move to 10 real quick. We'll come back and hit nine. A river flowed out of Eden the water of the gar- to, to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The first, uh, the name of the first is Pishon, and it is the one that flowed around the land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium, Bedellium's like a gum-like yellow resin type stuff that was was plentiful there, and ox, uh, onyx, which is a red carnelian type stone, are there. Precious stones are there. Now, why is Moses telling you that now? Moses understood where the location of the Garden of Eden was. Why does he give you these specifics about gold and this weird gum resin and that kind of stuff? Because he's not lying. That's the reason why. Liars don't give details. That's an important fact to learn about Scripture. Why is all this stuff in here? You ever talk to a kid? Where you been? What do they tell you? Nowhere. Nowhere. And they fidget. They got to be doing something. But if you have a kid say, you know what? I was over at Walmart because my breath was really bad. I really needed some gum, and so I got some Trident cinnamon, and then it turns out they were selling it for 96 cents a piece, so I bought three of them, and now my breath is kissing sweet. (laughs) Is that kid lying? He may be still, right? (laughs) But he's really good at it. So you kind of got to give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, if you're lying, you're in sin. God will deal with you. But that's pretty good. So liars don't give details is the idea. Why does he bring all that up? So notice there's a river that's coming out here. Verse 13. The name of the second river was Gihon. And it's the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And Cush, if you understand, and later on, uh, Abraham, or I'm sorry, Moses marries a Cushite woman. That would be uh, from northern Africa is what we're dealing with there geographically. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I've heard what some people have plotted this out. And they said, you know what? Actually, if you look at this in geography before the flood, all the rivers are listed backwards as opposed to how they're listed now. Very interesting. Because Euphrates flows into what? Anybody know? Persian Gulf. 
It flows into the Persian Gulf. Some people say if you list this out geographically before the flood, they, it's actually listed backwards. He's naming it off across there, and when he does, it's backwards from how they're set up now. The flood changed everything. Good point. So back to verse 9, because it's very significant. Out of the ground, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now stop for just a second. I'm not going to spoil it for you. But do me a favor, and if you mark in your Bible, and God's okay with that, if you do that, take your handy-dandy Grace Bible Church pen and mark this verse. Because I need you to pay attention to that, because we're going to come back to it later. The fact of that it's pleasant to the sight and good for food. That's very important. So notice what it says there. The Lord God made to spring up how many trees? Every tree. Every tree. It was pleasant to the sight. Looks good. Good for food. Man, it tastes good. It's going to nourish me thoroughly. But notice this little part here. The tree of life, tree number one, was in the midst of the garden. And number two, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees to choose from. Midst of the garden. Everybody pay attention to that. So now let's pop down to verse 15. Here's what I want to get at. Pull out your papers, please. What is a divine institution? A divine institution is a God-ordained system that was mandated before the fall. Now, why is this important? Because structurally speaking, it is setting up a divine method of operation because everything that God does is perfect. Everybody with me? Okay, let, let's, let's use this and let's explore it for just a second. The union of man and woman, is that a perfect union? Yeah. Praise God you said that. I'm sorry, you don't know my husband. Good job. Yes, it is a perfect union. How do we know that? God designed it. Do you get kids any other way? No, in fact, if you try to get kids through any other way, you are having to introduce foreign means to compensate what a denial of truth is. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people have difficulty getting pregnant. Some people medically can't get pregnant. Yes, I'm not downing that or anything. But I'm saying if we look at what it looks like in a sinless, perfect society, how did God set it up? There's the truth. Everybody see that? Now, notice what he's doing here. God's described himself as a laborer. The second divine institution is labor. It's work. It's not rest. It's work. There is something noble in the idea of working hard. Look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Stop for just a second. Go back up to verse 8. And the Lord God planted the Garden of Eden in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. Everybody see how those go together? This other verse here is giving you an extension of what you were seeing previously. So notice that. He puts him there, and let's finish the rest of that verse here. Notice it says here, verse 15, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to two things. First, work it. Now stop for a second. Everything's perfect. Why would he need to work the garden? Mm. See, everybody's worried about where Adam's belly button came from. That's not the real question, man. The real question is, why does God take Adam? We don't have any mention of Eve yet. Takes Adam, puts him in a garden. Your responsibility here is to work this garden. Everything's perfect. Why? Just having a rough year with bananas or what? I mean, I know those trees, but still. The tomato's just not making it. Why would he do that? What's that? Purpose. Does, does it give you a sense that God is just going to let Adam lay back on the beach and he's just going to sustain it all for him? Adam, you just hang out, man. You had a rough day, you know, all that dirt coming together and me breathing into you so that you could actually open your eyes and heartbeat. I mean, that, that's pretty rough, right? You lay here. Listen to the sand or listen to the ocean, whatever. And I'm just going to, I'll cultivate all this for you. No. Notice that he calls Adam into making his existence perpetual. Now you say, wait a second, Adam hasn't sinned, he can't die. No, but does he need to eat? Yeah, regardless, sin or not, we need to eat, right? That's kind of the thing we do with that. 
But yeah, he's going to eat. He needs to cultivate that. But here's an interesting thing. The idea of cultivating the ground. Look what it says. The second thing. It's not just work in the ground, but look what he says here. And keep it. What does your translation have? Keep it. Does it say keep it? Take care of it. Take it. There's no sin. There's no thorns. I mean, well, isn't thorns a result of the fall? Weeds are a result of the fall. Let's just be honest, man. Living here, mosquitoes are part of the fall. They weren't biting at them beforehand. They were picking on innocent mangoes and things like that. They weren't after flesh. They weren't after blood. Why does he say, work it and keep it? You know, examining this word, it's the idea of watching over or guarding. Now, I have a theory, and that's all that it is. Understand this. But we are to think critically about the Bible. Why in the world, in a perfect environment, would a perfect man, under submission to a perfect God, receiving a perfect task, need to guard a perfect garden? What's in there? Anybody know? What's that? Man, there's a, you guys sound like somebody just threw a bunch of speaking spells down the stairs. Somebody raise your hand and tell me. What do you think? He watches it and guards his creation. Okay, that's what God does. And so maybe Adam is representing that. Maybe this is him stepping up in dominion and that's part of it. Possibly. Okay, so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he might need to guard that. Here's the question. Guard it from who? Why is Satan scared of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Here's the question. Does Satan know good and evil? He does, doesn't he? So can't guard it from him. He don't need to eat from that tree. Oh, man, Every, it was great seeing all your faces. You all go, mm. <laughs> light bulbs are coming on. Why would God need to put something forward of the knowledge of, understand the tree's not evil. It's not an evil tree, okay? The knowledge of good and evil, which means that evil must have existed at that time. And if Adam is called to guard it, what does God know is going on And he gives man the opportunity of testing for defense. Who's he defending the garden from? Himself? No. He's not sinful. Satan. Now, does it clearly say that? And and Adam was to defend the garden from Satan, and so they gave him a machete and an M16. It doesn't say that stuff. (laughs) But what can we deduce from critically thinking about it? Well, why would there be a tree of good and evil if evil wasn't a possibility to understand or know and why in the world would he have to keep a perfect garden and guard a perfect garden if everything is perfect i think satan fell somewhere in the midst of this we're going to talk about that in two weeks don't miss next week next week everybody come and make sure you sleep really well and make sure you're very relaxed when you get here just letting you know Ooh, teaser uh but anyway but think about this There's now a responsibility, a responsibility that has been placed in his hands. The prohibition is, don't you eat of that tree. Now, here's the thing. Is is there a scarcity of food going around? None whatsoever. Notice, it's just don't eat of that one. You ever dealt with a kid like that? Man, you could have Toys R Us sitting in your living room, and you could say, stay off that first step. You guarantee that child has camped out on that first step and has smeared food all over it and is guaranteeing I have marked this as my own. Toys haven't been touched. You can take them back and get your money back. That step, just because you said don't want to. You know how that is. You've probably been the wet paint person, right? Because somehow it wasn't going to come off on our hands. But we had to test it, didn't we? We had to. Now remember, at this point, Adam is not like me. He's not like you. He's sinless. Still a creature. Still totally subservient, submissive to God. God is the creator. Don't get the creator-creature distinction messed up. So he's perfect. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. We will have the rest of the sermon for you next week, as well as having Pastor Jeremy in studio with us. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901. 
or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. Also, if you have missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, please visit our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down for the link for Walking in Grace radio program. All episodes will be available after they air. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse. You can also visit us on the web at gbcportage.com. Tune in next week for another episode of Walking in Grace.